Hi there, and welcome back to Asian Art. In today's lecture, I want to talk about the essential deities that make up Hinduism. In our previous lecture, we talked about the aesthetic qualities and purpose of Hindu deities as statues. In this case, I want to talk more about the specific symbolism and how the cosmology works. To begin with, one of the major organizing ideas in Hinduism is that there is a multitude of gods, and each individual Hindu has a relationship to certain deities over other deities. This overarching organization is that there are these three sort of primary deities known as the Brahman Trimurti, and that the sort of represent the three primary aspects of the overarching Godhead that all deities sort of really unify into a single deity. But no one is particularly concerned. This idea of Brahman is the sort of all-encompassing Godhead. The aspects of a deity are very important. The three main ones we'll be talking about, the Brahma and Trimurti, are Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. As we see in the statue, the three of them together on the left we have Brahma with the multi heads and he is the creator god in the center with the chakra wheel on his right shoulder is Vishnu the preserver the one that holds the universe together and on the right we have Shiva with his trident and there we see the god of change creation and destruction. Let's talk more about the deity Brahma. Brahma is a creator deity. He is chiefly responsible for bringing the universe into being. Now this is a big and very important job. Thus he has this large belly is deep in his meditation. He holds the seed of all creation. And when the world is sort of destroyed, uh, he holds on to the creation and brings it back into being. Now, these cycles of creation and destruction are enormously long. And yet, there have been a multitude of these. For in the Hindu cosmology, time is ultimately cyclical. It returns and the creation begins again, over and over and over again. Hence, in the Hindu cosmology, there is sort of essentially nothing new under the sun. And it all is unified by Brahma. People don't typically worship Brahma because his job is rather removed from everyday life, but he is an important anchor and an image that represents the idea of a sort of repository of all of creation. Here is the painting of the deity Brahma, and here we see him riding on a swan. He is often depicted wearing a beard and having four heads, each head representing the cardinal directions and the four Vedas. The Vedas are the way in which he is sort of the knowledge of the ancient Indian mythology of the Aryans that still remains a very important sort of spiritual center to Hinduism. The four arms, he is able to move and act in all directions. And the swan is what we call his Vahana. We'll talk more about them later. Each major deity is assigned a special animal that they ride on. Now let's talk about Shiva, the important deity who is the god of change. If you have ever seen a Hindu deity before, it is possible that you saw Shiva. 
There are many aspects to Shiva. This one I'm showing you now, Shiva as Nataraja, the god of dance, is perhaps one of the most famous representations of any Hindu deity. This is a specific style of statue from the Chola dynasty, and it is cast in bronze. Now, in the symbolism of Shiva, Shiva as the god of dance, he holds in one hand a drum and in the other a flame. The drum symbolizes the beat of life, the sense of time, dance, and movement, and also a signal of death and the the flame is like a funeral pyre, so he is, in a sense, creation and destruction. We see this very lively animated dance that he is making, and this is part of that idea of change. He is the god of dance. He is the god of change. So his hair flows out behind him, and it is in these long flowing strands called the jatas that set this energy that connects him to this sort of cosmic wheel that he is contained within. This particular wheel is sort of egg-shaped. Uh, very often the wheels can be perfectly round. We'll see in his right hand that is nearest to us the abhaya mudra, we talked about that, symbolizing the idea of fear not. And then his left arm crosses his body in the Gajahastra Mudra, which symbolizes this idea of creation. Now, if you look down at his feet, his leg is bent and his, this flowing movement, and it is standing directly on this character known as Apasmara. Apasmara is a character who symbolizes connection to the earth, a person who holds on and refuses to accept change. And so Shiva, as the god of change, crushes him underfoot. And so you are liberated like the foot that is raised if you accept change, and you are crushed underfoot if you do not. There are many different symbols for Shiva. Perhaps the most famous and most ancient symbol for Shiva is this symbol of this erect pedestal called the Linga, which is symbolic of the male member penis. And in this case, it is surrounded by a bull with a line through it, which is the yoni. The two of them together are the cosmic union of male and female principles. Now, this idea of the erect penis as a symbol of Shiva is a very ancient tradition in India. And while this may come as a shock to people who are not uh, used to the symbolism of Hinduism, I may remind them that this idea, while to us it seems sort of shockingly sexual, is in fact a deeply spiritual idea of a cosmic union between opposites, like we mentioned before in the loving couple of the Mithuna. Also, notice that in our ancient Indus Valley civilization, we had this seated figure, and the seated figure was sitting cross-legged with an erect penis. This is one of the images that has brought back the idea that Shiva may in fact be a very ancient deity that was worshipped at the time of the Indus Valley civilization. There is not enough evidence to be certain of this connection, but this one particular seal that we have found gives us some tantalizing evidence. Another important aspect of Shiva is Shiva representing both male and female deities. Here he is called Ardhanarisvara, the Lord as a woman. Now, I must make it abundantly clear. Shiva is male. He is explicitly male, represented by the erect penis. But in this case, he is also has within him his feminine side, which is known as Parvati, represented by the mirror held in the hand in the back on the right of this image. So we see the Shiva trident, 
then the snake, another image of Shiva. And we also see a bull, Nandi. And this is his vahana. He rides on a Brahma bull. And so we see this figure that is bifurcated with a feminine breast and hip and a masculine shoulder and hip. And these two sort of bodies inhabited one being. The being is Shiva Adana Risvara. Another thing you would notice a great deal in Hindu art is what we call the hierarchic scale. If you've noticed in many of the statues we've looked at earlier, there are smaller figures next to these large primary figures. The smaller figures are there as worshippers, as attendants, as offering puja to the deity. And when we approach the deity, no matter what the size, the actual scale of the statue is, we are to see ourselves in relationship to the great deity as the smaller figure. And so the hierarchic scale is a way of showing us the importance of Shiva in our lives. So the trident, the Brahma bull, are also these very important symbols of Shiva, and they represent this idea that he is a being with great power and the possibility of change. The bull is a worshipped in India. Hindus will not eat beef, and the cows are given a kind of sacred status and are allowed to roam wherever they will. This is one of our earliest uh, representations of Shiva. Draw out this idea. We see this figure of Shiva, clearly male, standing before a giant erect penis. And below him is this creature, Apasmara, whom he is subjugated. This is the Parashmeshvara temple in the Shunga period in the Orissa in the first century BCE. This is the oldest representation we have of Shiva that has survived down to the present day. And we can see very clearly his masculine character is clearly delineated in this statue. Shiva has two children. One is the god of war, and the other is the god of creativity and wealth and good fortune. And that is Ganesh, the god of good fortune. He also is the patron supporter of artists. As we see here, uh, a small figure on the lower right is a devotee playing music. We also see them up in the back holding musical instruments and also garlands of wealth and prosperity. Ganesh is a very important deity. If you are trying to get anything done, he is a abundantly helpful deity who loves to serve people. This is in evidence by his symbolism. The rice bowl that is his trunk hovers over is an offering. He loves to eat and he loves to be uh, serve those people who feed him. You also see a very important symbol of Ganesh is in his left hand, a broken tusk. His is his own tusk, as you see, is broken off. He has taken and broken off his tusk because when he was asked to help a poet, Vayasa, write down the Mahabharata, he quickly ascended to assist in this monumental task by breaking off his own tusk to use as a writing instrument. Also, in the lower right, we see a mouse, and that is Ganesha's Vahana. Like many deities, he has this lotus flower base. The lotus flower is this very important symbol and is a kind of image of perfection emerging out of the dross and grime and dirt of ordinary existence. And thus, these deities are the kind of lotus bloom that comes out uh, from nothing. Our third and final deity we'll be talking about 
is Vishnu, the god of preservation. So we've talked about Brahma, the creator who brings the universe into being and then goes back and meditates. And we've talked about Shiva, who brings on changes and brings things into being and things things out of being. And then we have Vishnu, the preserver, who holds everything together, who maintains the universe so that even after it's been destroyed, so that he can bring it to Brahma, to bring it back into creation again. He is uh, the deity that represents the sense of constancy and a sense of order to the universe. Worshippers of Vishnu are often referred to as Vaishnavism. It is a people who have good fortune, people who are uh, want to maintain the world the way it is, uh, often worship Vishnu, whereas the people who worship Shiva, the Shaivites, they often are people who are poor or downtrodden or in a difficult way and need to hope for change. We can see the primary symbols of Vishnu in this statue here, a conch shell, which is a symbol, a signaling call to action, and the chakra, this wheel, which symbolizes uh, the ability to kind of hold things together. Now, Vishnu, as a preserver, needs to come and act in the world to kind of help hold things together. When the world goes out of balance, Shiva intercedes on the behalf of humans to kind of hold things together. And he's done this many different times in different creations. And to do this, he comes down as an avatar. He doesn't directly influence events, but he manifests himself as a mortal being. And that can be a fish, a tortoise, a boar, half man, half lion, a dwarf. Uh, Parushrama, the Rama with the axe, Rama, the hero of the Ramayana, and Krishna, the divine cowherd and advisor to the Pandava in the Mahabharata. Many Hindus believe that Vishnu also is the Buddha, although this is not a part of the Buddhist faith. And there is one important incarnation of Vishnu, Kalkin, the incarnation yet to come. The story of the Ramayana, which we will discuss in class in our video, Sita Sings the Blues, is a very important story. There's a great deal of art that deals with the chronicles of the hero Rama and his battles with the demon Ravana. You see many different examples of that in folk art. In the Ramayana, here we see Rama and his brother Lakshmana with the monkeys in the tree, and they are firing a magical arrow uh, at the demon Ravana with his ten heads. Another very important avatar of Vishnu is Krishna, who is featured in the Mahabharata, and the Puranas, his, his earlier life story, is explored. In the Mahabharata, he has an enigmatic figure who counsels the good guys, the Pandava, into important decisions about how to win this terrible war with their cousins, the Kurawa. This is a hugely complicated story, and Krishna's role in all these events is quite complex in that he is willing to compromise and lie and cheat in order to succeed. In the Puranas, we see him more as a virtuous young child and doing things in ways that bring good fortune to people throughout the world. So those are the primary deities of the Brahman Trimurti. Another very important deity that is co-equal to all the male aspects of the Brahman Trimurti, is Devi, the great goddess. The goddess Devi has many different aspects. In this particular painting we have here from 1725, we see Mahadevi, the great goddess, as Durga, 
with all these weapons. She is showing she is the overthrower of tyrants, meaning any man who puts himself up above the gods. It is Durga who will come and lay you low. Devi also is represented as a symbol of fertility. Here we see Parvati from the Chola dynasty bronzes and have a similar style to the Shiva Nataraja we saw earlier. In this case here, we see this sort of flowing, undulating uh, gestures and body posture, the Angika, and the Gajahasta Mudra on the left, and the, the figure, and the Kataka Mudra held in the right hand nearest to the viewer. The Kataka Mudra means a sense of wonder, a sense of awe and enchantment, that we are to be enchanted and to feel a sense of awe for this uh, beauty and source of fertility. Now let's review what we've covered in this lecture. If you have any trouble with any of these questions, please go back and review the lecture again. Question 1. How is the Brahman Trimurti Godhead divided? Question 2. What kinds of symbols represent Shiva? Which god is the patron of the arts? Question 4. How does Vishnu restore balance to the world? Question 5. Which other important deities are not among those in the Brahman Trimurti? Question 6. 